Hi, this is Larry London, and we welcome you to a very special edition of Border Crossings. I seem to be saying that a lot lately. We've had so many wonderful guests on our program, but today we are, are blessed. There's no other way to put it, uh, to be joined by a man who is a true living legend, uh, an icon in the business, a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, who with his brothers, the late uh, Robin and Maurice, sold over 250 million records. We'd like to welcome to the Voice of America, Sir Barry Gibb. It's great to have you on VOA. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Pleasure to now, be you here. Now, were, uh, you were knighted by Prince Charles, and I was reading somewhere where yeah. you struggled to get up after <laughs> you were knighted. Well, uh, you know, I, I got a bad angle uh. and a bad knee. You know, he, he caught, <laughs> caught me on a good day, <laughs> you know, uh, but he's such a sweet man. So uh, his response to me was, it doesn't get easy, does well, it? Well, what an honor, you know, and I imagine yeah. just kneeling down and getting the sword. I mean, here in America, oh, we don't have it's... such an honor, but uh, I know. Well, you, you sort of do. You have the, the medal of uh, the peace medal and all of those wonderful things, if you're fortunate mm -hmm. enough to get that. I think every country has a little bit of that. Well, you know, uh, you, you know? began your career. I don't have to tell you, I'm telling the audience, obviously. You began your career in the 50s uh, as a part of what was called the Rattlesnakes at the time, before yeah. you became the Bee Gees, and uh, ultimately ended up becoming the Bee Gees, and, yeah. and the legacy is, is well documented. How has the business changed over the years? I mean, having been a part of it for as many decades as you have, you've, you've written that wave all throughout all these years. Well, you've got to catch that wave too, you know, so it's like um, not, not everything you do is going to work. We were just very, very uh, driven about, about what we were doing and fame was, the, fame was the whole mission, you know. We didn't know that we could actually make money from it and that just sort of happened a lot later, a lot later. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think the industry um, has taken on different incarnations. I just think it's a it's very different industry now than it was then. And it was a much more simple life then. There wasn't so many artists as there are now. And it's a very crowded scenario. So if you're going to do something, you really got to make it important. You've got to make it count, you know? And even in the, even in the end, don't expect it to work, you know? Mm -hmm. Hope for it to work. You have written so many songs, not only for yourself and not only for the Bee Gees, but you wrote, uh, I guess, Islands in the Stream for Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton. Yes. Um, you yeah. wrote a number of hits over the years. You yes. know, In fact, a lot of people don't give you the credit. You wrote Grease, which yeah. is the theme song to one of the biggest films in the 70s. You wrote yes. the theme song. Yeah, that was sort of accidental. Um, Robert Stigwood called me up and asked me if I had any ideas for a song called Grease because they didn't have a title song. They never did have a title song. So my question to Robert was, well, what do I write about? It's a word, you know, what do I write about? And he said, well, Greece, da, 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 Greece, da, 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 da. And I went, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll call you back. And there it was, so, Greece is the word, is the word, is the word. I went out in the so, dock and, and that's what it became. And of all the, the songs that you've written, which many have reached number one and for other artists, which have had number one success because of you, is songwriting, how would you rank? Is songwriting, performing, what is, in order of your preference, in order of your favorite part of this oh, business? Uh, songwriting, more than anything. Mm. Um, I've always felt that that's what it, it, that was my purpose. And, and it became my brother's purpose as well. Mm -hmm. And that just became the most important thing. So performing and singing was a blessing because we were able to live the life of the song. Mm -hmm. To actually not find someone to sing it, but to do it ourselves. So it was, it, it was, it was a combined blessing. But songwriting, mm. that's it for me. You know, I started when I was about eight, eight or nine years old. And I was, I was pretending to be an art a former when I was four years old. So there are things you can't explain. Hmm. Did you, you ever explain. record any of the songs that you wrote long, long ago? Did you ever revisit well, those songs? Yeah, I mean, uh, Butterfly on, the, on, on this album, uh, Greenfields, uh, with Gillian Welch and Dave Rowland, who was written in 1966. And um, uh, Words of a Fool, Jason Isbell was written in approximately 1984, so 85 maybe. Mm. But those were songs that hadn't really seen the light, the light of day, and and I and I wanted to feature them on this album because I always loved those songs. There are other songs, there are other songs, and I'd like to do that. Barry Gibb, if you're just tuning in, uh, Barry is number one on the Americana song charts, the first time in I guess 42 years back at number one. It's got to yeah. feel good. Greenfield's The Gibb Brothers Songbook, Volume One, is the name of the album. 
and it is in the Americana genre. So you've done quite a few different sounds in your career. Well, I, I, I love to change. I, I've never felt threatened by change. And uh, even when we were kids and we emigrated to Australia, we loved the idea of we didn't know where we were going and the change was, it was a tropical thing. And we loved, we just fell in love with Queensland. And, uh, and we've always liked to just reinvent ourselves in some way. We, the trouble for us was that we never what we were doing was, was going to get dumped at some point because it happens to everybody so we had to think ahead you know and really just enjoy ourselves and in the end we found out how to enjoy ourselves but really it was a lot of stress and a lot of hope and a lot of you know when things worked it was amazing and when they didn't it was disappointing but that's who we were that's what it was you yeah, know, we yeah. were never a constant perpetual number one group we, ju we just danced around everything that wasn't good and celebrated everything that was great mm. well i mean the yeah. Bee Gees obviously have carved a, a, a place in music history. Uh, so your, your, your great far outweighs your, your misses, but uh, it is, it's a thrill and an honor to have you on the show today. And I, and in, in, in addition to Americana, of course, you guys were called the Kings of disco back in the day, but then you, you did country music. You, you even were on the grand old Opry. But I always wanted to be a country artist. Even when I was a kid in Australia, you only really saw country artists who were called rock and roll artists. So from Johnny Cash to Roy Orbison to all those wonderful songs that, that Nashville comes up with that don't, doesn't happen anywhere else was always in our blood, you know? Mm -hmm. And a great song is usually a country song for us. Mm -hmm. And so we wrote a lot of country songs. Islands in the Stream and Come On Over for Olivia. And we just wrote a lot of songs that we, that, you know, I personally had the passion for bluegrass and country music Morris did too. Robin was a little different, you know. He he wasn't quite into that, but he was into R and B and Otis Redding and and, it, and maybe it was a mixed bag, but it worked in the it worked between us. You know? mm -hmm. Now I imagine there's 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 an empty space or several empty spaces when you know you're on stage and you perform one of the Bee Gees greats and you're not there with you right. know with Robin and Maurice right. or even Andy, uh, your youngest yeah. brother. I mean, yeah. Oh yeah, it's still very. It still really impacts me. I, I don't, uh, I don't take it lightly. I, and I, when I'm at the microphone, I always think of them being around me. And I know that there's going to be some fun and games going on that I can't see because that's what they would, that's what they would do. And that was to, to make things, to make some things come across as funny and silly. And, you know, Morris used to have a tie that, that became erect. You know, in <laughs> in the middle of a song, but Robin and I wouldn't see that. You know? <laughs> I think he bought it in a joke shop, you know. But during our early days, we'd be in the middle of a love song, and the tie would come up, you know. <laughs> and the audience loved that stuff. Mm. The little known facts about the Bee Gees, True. things that you didn't know behind the scenes. Now, I guess a lot of these stories are told in the uh, the new documentary on HBO, which is uh, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart. Yes, sir. And uh, so, you know, if you can just take a, a piece of that, you know, from either your autobiography story or the, the documentary, right. what would be a favorite story that you would tell about, you know, the days with your brothers back in the Bee Gees? I, I, they're all, it's, you know, it's millions of moments, Larry. I, 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 to pick one out is, is, is not really something I'm capable of doing right at this moment. But, but um, you know that um, constantly making records, constantly we didn't live with each other. You know, we came to the studio, and that's that's when it would be a love festival. And beyond that, I, I think uh, my brothers didn't really connect with each other's families. We didn't really, you know, hang out together, mm -hmm. and that's the way life was. You know. Let me ask you this: um, as far as the pandemic is concerned, yeah. and you are at home now in your studio in England. So tell me Miami. about. The yeah. pandemic, yeah. How is how is that going in your life? I mean, how has that changed how you do what you do? Well, it's chaos. You can't go anywhere. And if you could go anywhere, there isn't anywhere to go. So you find yourself wandering around the house and looking for a purpose. And and that's life now. That's how we have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's like in your part of the country, but Miami's crazy and LA is crazy. And I still don't understand why they lifted the lockdown because it's not like things are getting better, you know? I look right. forward to the day when they do, but I don't think it'll ever be things getting back to normal. I don't believe that. I think, mm. I think things will never be quite the same again. 
Mm. And we just have to be a little more, a little more uh, fat, safe, a little more safe, you know? Mm. In, uh, in your business, America. it's all about interaction with the audience. Um, and so now yeah. it's, it's hard to do that given the limitations right. we have. That's right. It's very difficult. And, and you can't. But what I'm looking forward to putting on a show in, in the way that uh, Bruce Springsteen did, maybe on Broadway, and, uh, wow. and, and, and to just making the story of the Bee Gees a, a, a good story, a fun story, you mm -hmm. know? And, and their, their passing, I don't really want to be the person who talks about their passing anymore. I want the wives to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like it's my spiritual mission now to talk about each one of them passing, mm -hmm. because that in itself was, was really devastating. Right. And so, you know, uh, I'm trying to distance myself from having to tell people now how they died, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I just got to deal with it. I can't, I've not seen the documentary, Larry. I've seen, I've seen little bits of it in the beginning. I had my comments and from then on having an, having an open mind and not having that stuff in my head was, was healthy, was healthy for me. How have you managed to stay grounded? Given the fame, I mean, you're the third most successful band of all time on the Billboard charts. You know, only the Beatles and Supremes are, are above the Bee Gees. But I mean, all of the accomplishments you've made, I mean, how did you stay grounded all these years? Well, first of all, I, did, I didn't know the Supremes <laughs> had yeah. that kind of supremacy. That's great. That's great, you know. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how all that stuff happens. I, we just kept writing songs. And, and then suddenly you find the, stat the statistics are greater than you thought they were, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but we never stopped writing and maybe that accounts for it, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know, Larry, I just don't know. Um, happy to be there. Yes, happy yes. To be, happy to be anywhere. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you have worked with, um, as I mentioned, many artists, you've written for many artists, you've also worked with many artists. And I think you did something with Coldplay not too long ago. What is the plan for the future? Any collaborations uh, going I on? I hope so, I hope so, because Chris is, is, is a great guy and I'd love to work with him. Uh, what I've done with Coldplay was a single live performance at Glastonbury where I did Stay Alive with them. And then the next year I got to do, oh no, it was Dolly the next year. And then the following year I got that legend spot and I, I performed on my own and it was, it was the thrill of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen that many people appreciate what we were doing. And, I, and they were all wearing those jackets that you might've worn in the late seventies, you know? And I, they talked me into putting one on on the stage, and and I, and I did. But what a what a day! What a day that was! And I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. And of all of the uh, the superstars that you mingle with, you mm. hang out with, co mingle with, uh, who's had the greatest influence on your your life, your career, both musically and as a person? Well, the Beatles, obviously, and and, and right from the very beginning, and the Hollies, and the Fortunes, and that whole Mersey. Mersey scenario with Eric and all the people at NEMS, we were assigned to the Beatles company. So when you're asking me about the greatest moments, that would certainly be one of them, you mm -hmm. know, being signed to Brian Epstein's company and, and seeing the Beatles come and go and things like that. It was quite a rush. Quite Did a you rush. have a, an aha moment that you said, we've got something here? Was there an event or yeah, something? Uh, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, I think really hit home for us. We, we, uh, Robin came up with the, the idea in New York during a trip around the harbor and he sang the idea to us uh back at the saint regis and we we finished the song i think within a half an hour mm -hmm. and because it was an easy song to sing and an easy song to write so um that's how it came about and i think that was a an aha moment if you like always but um always had us jumping up and down we just loved him and we got to see him perform at uh, the speakeasy and we saw him perform at savile theater and that, you know we, we, we were fanatics from the word go so that mixture of otis redding and country music and bluegrass music was really inside us and anything else was a reinvention you know mm. well anyone who has had the the privilege, the uh, benefit of being in music and still being working, you know, 60 years later after they started yeah, yeah. Um, is, is 
certainly have a large fan base and those fans have children who have children. So you have, and, and you guys are a good clean band, a good role model band, you know, you, especially your lifestyle, whatever, how you've lived. Um, you, you've inspired so many people and it's great to see those fans who followed you through the generations. Yes, it is. I, I, I'll never understand it, but, but I love them and I love anyone who cares about our music. Mm -hmm. I don't really relate to people who will always find an issue with us, but they do. And not everybody loves everything. And, and you just keep moving. And I think activity, activity is the therapy that I have. Mm -hmm. It's if I'm in action, if I'm doing what I love doing the most, then I don't, I don't think about grief and I don't think about loss as much as I might have if I was just sitting doing nothing. And when you're on stage, and obviously you were, like I say, the sex symbol of the Bee Gees and still a sexy <laughs> guy now in 74. <laughs> um, so what's the weirdest thing that a groupie ever did? I mean, how, how did a groupie oh. get in? <laughs> <laughs> Every band's got a me. story. Yeah, this was a good one. Um, <laughs> I think we were doing a gig in New York and uh, I'm trying to remember where it was. I can't. It was an outdoor gig and Spanky and our gang were also in that bill. And it was our show and it wasn't, we were not that good. And we were still trying to get packed, punched through in America. And so it wasn't a, a big, a big gig. You know, we had a few thousand, but not, not that many. And when we were leaving, of course, we had the limo and we jumped in the limo and everything was, uh, you know, sort of like pop stars. This is great. you know. And we had the window down so we can, so I could wave to people, you know, and this girl runs up to the car puts her arm in the car and grabs me where you shouldn't grab anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and the car was still going. <laughs> so this girl was holding on and I'm begging her to let go. And, and the car kept moving. And eventually, you know, she let go. Not, not without a great deal of pleasure. <laughs> Lucky she let go. <laughs> I know, I, I thought twice about that later. <laughs> Well, you did wear very tight pants back in the day. Well, you have you to know, admit there, were, there were tight <laughs> pants before the 70s, believe me. <laughs> we're talking with Sir Barry Gibb of, of course, not only the Bee Gees fame, but also his own solo career achievements. And that includes the new album, Greenfields, the Gibb Brothers Songbook Volume 1, which has been number one. And right. what is, I mean, the new album, how does it differ from the last album you put out? Well, the last album was called In the Now, and it was it was basically me wanting to do a country album, but but the record company said, no, don't do that, you know, just do just be Barry, you know, mm -hmm. and but the passion has, has, has stuck with me, so I didn't enjoy not being able to make the album I wanted to make. This time, this was a dream, and and my eldest son Stephen played me a Chris Stapleton song, and I just freaked out. I said, you know, this is this is real. These are real people playing real music. And, and someone singing real songs. And that's where we got to go, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I said, who produces this? And, and, and Stephen said, oh, a guy called Dave Cobb. I said, that's, that's who I want to work with. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can interest him. Mm -hmm. And Steve went to Nashville and started chatting to people like Dave Cobb and, and along with Jay Landers, they were able to, uh, this guy said, yes, this gentleman said, yes. And I was just floored. So from then on, it was a mission and, and I had to live up to everything I'd asked for. And I admire so many country artists. And then the one person who said yes was Dolly and then Alison Krauss and then Keith Urban. And I just couldn't believe it. I just thought, wow, we're actually going to be able to do this, you know? Mm -hmm. So those are people that I admire the most. Brandy Carlisle and mm -hmm. Little Big Town and, you know. What a, what a blast, just being in the same room with some of these artists. You know? Why the name Greenfields? What's the relevance of that? Well, the relevance of it is that for most of these artists and me, we grew up in that environment. We grew up in, with, uh, in the countryside with Greenfields and, and mountains. I, 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 I still live in the Isle of Man subconsciously, you know, mm. which is a very ancient island full of mythology and folklore. Like Ireland, they have their own fairies they call them fairies or elves you know mm -hmm. it's a very mystical place and and the, the the countryside was magnificent and i'd walk to school and those memories never go away and i think that that's why i called it greenfields because mm -hmm. i think it's something we're all we all have in common and uh, so barry has it always been a falsetto i mean that's really you were in a whole different league you created a very unique sound 
Um, but you had the high voice, the falsetto, which was a signature of the Bee Gees and of Barry Gibb. So yeah. was that always the plan? No, no, there never was a plan, you know. <laughs> um, um, in the in the sixties, um, Robin took lead, or I took lead, or we or we all sang together, you know. Um, there was never really a plan. The falsetto was a discovery. I didn't know I could do that, except that I did a song on Bee Gees first called Please Read Me, where I multi-tracked in falsetto. So I remember doing that. And when Arif Marden was working with us, he said, can any of you scream in falsetto, sort of a little bit like a McCartney type of screen for Nights on Broadway? And can, does anyone want to try? And I, I remember back then, and I thought, well, I'll have a go. I don't even know if, it's, if I can do that anymore, but I'll have a go. But I didn't know it was a lead voice. I didn't know it was something that would turn up on every every kind of record we made from then on. And, uh, and I don't think everyone was happy about it, but, but everyone said the same thing, uh, do that voice again. Mm -hmm. And I would go, well, you know, but you know, we need to do different kinds of songs and Rob needs to sing more and maybe Mo should sing a bit more. And I, I, you know, I'm getting a little bored with this myself, you know, mm -hmm. but they would all say, oh, go on, do it because it'll be a hit, you know? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't always true. Um, for the in the hottest times, yes, it, it, it was a truism. But as time went on, it was also something that would get on your nerves. So we just we we worked our way through that. Um, I don't do it now. I have done it on this album one time in uh, "How Deep Is Your Love" with Little Big Town. But you know, it's no longer comfortable to to sing <laughs> that way. You know what I mean, Larry? It's just <laughs> hello. <laughs> Well, you have such a good voice, you know, I mean, really, uh, love your music, your songwriting, your singing. It's all wonderful. And I know that uh, your worldwide fans are so anxious, as we're broadcasting today, to know when you're going to get back on the road. And of course, a lot of that's out of your control, based yeah. on, you know, the health situation. But I'm sure you're planning to go international. Do you have favorite places you like to go internationally? Oh, yes. Uh, Australia, definitely. New Zealand. I, I love those places with a passion. I love the Pacific, South Pacific, and and uh, places like Hong Kong, and that's a tough gig now. Yes, <laughs> yes. it might have been a great one twenty years ago, but I'm not so sure now. You know, <laughs> it might be a little scary. And if people yeah, want to reach out to you, social media, where can they find Sir Barry Gibb? Official Barry Gibb on Instagram and Facebook and Facebook and Gibb Barry on Twitter and Gibb Barry on Twitter. Okay, that's where you go. All right, there it is. And hopefully the worldwide <laughs> audience will find you and certainly find the new album, which is Greenfield's The Gibb Brothers Songbook, Volume 1. Sir Barry Gibb, what an honor, a privilege, and a thrill to meet you and have you on. I have been a fan for many years. I remember watching you at the Pontiac Silverdome perform in Detroit. Wow. Yeah, I remember I that one. I remember that one. Yes, and, <laughs> and you have given me so many personal great memories. Um, thank you. Thank Larry. you so much for joining us. Thank you, sir. And I hope the, that you'll yeah. come on this uh, show again when you're in D.C. Oh. and in our studios. I'd love to. Is there a message you to. want to send out to the troops and to your worldwide fans right now? Yeah, be safe, you know. Uh, just be safe. Uh, whatever, whatever's going on around us, maybe we're just not that conscious of how, how, how horrible this thing is. And so whatever, wherever you are in the world, you know, just be safe. Take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thank you, Barry Gibb. It's been an honor and a pleasure to speak to you, a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and uh, one of the great songwriters, one of the great singers and entertainers of all time. It's a thrill to have you on the show and much success to you, continued success to you for uh, the new album Greenfields and, and all of the other projects that you have coming up in the future. My name is Larry London. Thank you so much for tuning in to our special show today featuring Sir Barry Gibb. You are watching Border Crossings. I'll see you soon. Thank you.